Homes officers and primarily are working in the um, downtown um, business district, um, interacting with people that are in some, some form of crisis. Oftentimes, that, that intersects with the transient population that the officers would, um, you know, have you know, multiple daily contacts with. And, um, they've been very successful in diverting um, individuals that would come in contact and, uh, within that context to divert them to some wraparound services. Um, whether it was treatment, um, getting them re-regulated on, on meds or uh, in some temporary housing. So again, it's been, it's, so far it's been a great alternative to what typically would be um, basically two choices, and that would be a trip to the um, hospital for medical purposes or um, a trip to the jail, which oftentimes was just a revolving door and was not... Um, uh, you know, not the best alternative. Um, a few months ago, this council generously recognized the importance of growing this program and four additional um, um, positions were funded uh, to continue this partnership with the Department of Mental Health. Uh, those positions have been posted um, and interviews are scheduled for Thursday of this week um, to fill the four clinicians. Um, we have, you know, well over 100 officers that are crisis intervention trained in every single region and uh, those clinicians will be partnered with um, our CIT officers to respond to, again, calls for service that involve people in crisis and also um, being proactive and interacting with our transient population to potentially identify someone that might fall in that category where they can deliver services. Can you tell us anything about how many incidents you've had that they've responded to and are they available 24-7 or do they work a shift? Uh, they work a shift or call back. Obviously, the additions um, of these positions will give us greater capacity, um, and, and we potentially will be able to staff on a schedule for certain certain hours. Uh, we know when we have certain events that require services or peak times that we encounter um, folks, but we will continue to exercise our um, our dashboard every evening. And I mentioned in one of my previous presentations. Um, every day we have a roster that goes to our watch commanders that um, says where everybody in the city is assigned and what trainings or um, specialties that they, they have, whether a crisis negotiator or a SWAT officer or, um, carry a less than lethal munition, something that they can use on the calls for service. But, but now on that roster um, we have people that are crisis intervention trained that are designated. So if there's a call for service with someone that is in crisis and they divert that officer to that call for service. Um, we've had well over um, 100 um, interactions and resulted in referrals since we've stood up the program. Chief, can you, um, do you have enough applicants, do you think, to fill the position? I don't know what the exact number was, um, Councilman Taylor, the, um, but I do know that um, the, uh, the number of people interviewed, um, there would be enough people to fill the four positions if they successfully interview. When do you expect to have the program fully implemented? Because I think we budgeted in some vehicles too. Is that right? Obviously, the the vehicles are a process, um, um, but um, the way we have we've worked with Department of Mental Health, they've used some pool um, a pool vehicle for the the um, the current clinician that's embedded, and I'm confident. Um, we, uh, we won't have anybody on foot patrol that um, we'll have them in a vehicle, whether it's paired up with our officer that's already assigned a car or if we're able to use some of our um, pool vehicles. And police. Just so I understand this, I mean, the people that you that apply for these positions are already trained in this, right? We don't go, or is there a training period that they have to go through once they become part of this? Well, the, so I guess the training would be how to work more um, hand in glove with law enforcement. They 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 already have the clinical and field experience dealing with um, people in crisis. So really, it's how they um, can better complement how we do our job. And then admission is to really. I think when we started talking about it, I just, admission was to move the homeless off the street. Basically, uh, I would encourage you. I, I think hopefully Dr. Bussels has our home, first homeless commission meeting coming up. I hope be a part of that first meeting to discuss a little bit about this program and how it can how it can be how it can be worked out. Absolutely. I, um, I I intend to be present for that. We'll kind of give a state of affairs 
uh, with our homeless population from from our lens and and how we think this program you know is going to um, create better quality of life for for that particular vulnerable population and I take it too that this would give us the opportunity I mean I, I personally witnessed some homeless panhandling situations out and around the community that to me implies they're professionals, not necessarily <laughs> homeless. And I take it this will be one means that we're able to separate that, you know, where it's tough to plead homeless if you're not homeless, but they're trying to take you to a shelter and we can, we can, because I, I have a feeling some of that's being bust, not bust in, but brought in from out of town. Because it's always, you never notice, Chief, they're always on the perimeter of the city. You only see them down in the city center just every once in a while out there at uh, District 4 at the Walmart and Harbison Boulevard and places like that. So I think we'll see that. We do see some hot spots and we see some, some trends when we, um, you know, get complaints of certain encampments. Um, when we, when we um, clean up an encampment or, uh, or move people around, oftentimes that's just what we're doing. We're kind of pushing it from one location to the next. So, um, you know, I, I think we've got this – Homeless Task Force Committee, whatever the official title will be, has its work cut out for it. Well, and I mentioned to the mayor recently, and you know, I think I think we saw with the homeless situation out on uh, Forest Drive that when we enforced, they did move to a different they moved to a different municipality, and and somehow we probably ought to ought to forewarn our our neighbors that the tougher we get on this. Because it's, I think, unfortunately, that, that most of our communities in the Midlands have relied on the city of Columbia to bear most of the social costs on these type of issues. And, and, and as we begin to, to be more proactive in addressing it, um, we might want to just tell them. We're always going to be good neighbors. That is, okay. You got it. Thank you, sir. I did want to make sure I confirm, too, um, in addition to dealing with the homeless population, I, for some reason my understanding, too, is that um, these clinicians would help deal with um, mental health issues that may have nothing to do with homelessness and help with de-escalation. Absolutely. Okay. Chief, the, the um, CPD person on these teams, is that going to be a static person, or you, are you going to be able to use any of the people, 100-plus, that have already gone through crisis intervention? We would like to get to the point where they're uh, designated partners um, you know, as they develop that working relationship. But uh, initially, out of the starting gate, we'll, we'll utilize a pool of officers. All right. Any further questions? And it just could be a total of five. It would be five teams Perfect. with uh, an officer and a clinician for on each team. What are we going to do? Maybe June 1st? Make the wait to June 1st? Um, I think that's a realistic goal for for hiring and you know onboarding. It, if the interviews go well Thursday, and Teresa, and I won't jump the gun, but if if we get them hired and we are out there, I think this will be um, a good thing for the for the chief and whoever speaks to our community groups like Rotary clubs to talk about and to get to you know and to to get an, an announcement that. I don't know, Chief. You, you know, like I said, there have been some situations out there where where we've had folks that may have had some mental health issues that put themselves in some intimidating situations at, at some places. So, you know, I guess when people call in to, on a nine one one call or whatever, they would specify and then say, "You know, we got a homeless problem or a mental health problem," and that's how you know they they, they, get, they go from dispatch. Most of them would go from dispatch, but um, and then our, our watch commander would also is also monitoring that and can direct. But um, you know, we also want these units to be proactive. You know, we know where our hot spots are, um, where our activity, where our encampments are, um, where we experience you know some of the biggest issues surrounding um, you know people that we find in crisis. To your point, it could be not just a homeless person, but um, so we want them to be proactive. Um, sure. No, and I just like to say, whether it's a joint joint letter or a letter from the city manager and the police chief, the mayor, 
to the neighborhood associations. I, I, again, I think this is a great step in the right direction. I think it's something Tracy ought to be very proud of, and uh, I think we need to do what we can to put to put the word to put the word out that, that we're being responsive to what what we what we've heard and seen. Yes, sir. We'll definitely do that. We'll be happy to. Is this the first one that's been stood up in South Carolina? I, I don't think so. There's there's some models in the Low Country. Um, the, the county has clinicians embedded um, as well. I think we have maybe the biggest group of them when we get to five. I don't. Does anybody have? The sheriff's Department doesn't have five. Well, we'll call it the biggest group. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, and and just to Mr. Taylor's point to the the better information they can get on the front end through dispatch is better because that was the issue with the. Um, the thing that happened in Richland County, no one gave any indication that it was a mental health issue. They just said that the guy was trying to stab someone. So um, I don't know what those questions are during dispatch, nor do I care to know, but I think the more information we can get from people so that we um, deploy the, the proper people at the right time is going to be helpful. Denise, did you, did you handle the, the advertisements for the, the Department of Mental Health did? Ready to go to item one now? Yes, sir. We certainly can. Item one is the review of the uh, compensation and pay structure. And uh, Pam, you've got the floor. Use your speaker. Yeah, it's a team effort. <laughs> so we're going to all be ready to pass the ball. Chime in. <laughs> yes. It is a collective discussion. So we certainly want, thanks, Corey. We want to have Chief in here to, to, kick, to kick it off because it certainly impacts them. And I wanted to make sure, Pam, that Stacy is on and can hear us and that sort of thing. Is that true? And maybe give an introduction of who she is. Stacy, you're muted, if you wouldn't mind unmuting for us. Stacy, are you there? All right, so Stacy is our consultant from Evergreen um, Consulting, and she will be doing a session, a section of this presentation to talk about um, compensation. She, we have contracted with her to help us come up with a comprehensive compensation plan for police officers. And so she's going to, once she's teed up, she's gonna go through some of her slides to show us what that final product is gonna look like. So we'll go ahead and get started. Skip, if you wanna, Chief, if you wanna go ahead and. I would, so um, thank you all for you know, calling this important meeting. Um, I, I wanted to kind of, just like I did with um, our, our first topic, give some context. Um, and acknowledge a couple of things. You know, this is this seems to be a, a conversation we frequently have here, and and I'm, I always appreciate the, the manager and and council giving us an audience to, to talk through this, and 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 also the um, the generous bumps that they have done, made over the years to address our pay. But we're kind of in unprecedented times, and that's what I really wanted to, you know draw some attention to. I, I was looking at some national trends, um, and they're showing 44% increase in retirements, 18% in resignations. Um, a lot of that's attributed to, um, you know, what was referred to as COVID fatigue and um, in post uh, George Floyd. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, the uh, law enforcement in particular went through a, a significant period of time where we had dealing with lots of protests and and you know that's something that makes Columbia very unique in my opinion you, know, you have these national trends and um, we're, we're very much affected by that being a, um, a capital city and um, in a unique capital city you know we uh, were not immune to the protests we had a couple of days of riots but then we had 60 days of protests um, and that's significant um, because on top of dealing with 60 days of protests then COVID right on top of all that. 
but every single day in Columbia, which is what makes us unique in the low country, upstate, and the PD, um, you know, our, our population fluctuates. You know, 75, someone in the chamber would even say 100,000. We have people coming to work, going to school, going to doctor's appointments, um, visiting, and doing state government business. We have state government that's housed here. There's people that come and go um, all day long, and it contributes to our 170,000 plus calls for service. It contributes to us, you know, responding to 8,000 8, plus vehicle crashes a year. Um, and I say all that, and then we just talked about, you know, our transient population and, and the the time spent on that. If you look at all of that in conjunction with um, the COVID and the protests and um, the state of affairs we're in with, you know, the national narrative, um, that creates incredible mental stress and physical stress on our officers. And what we hear with a lot of officers that um, are transitioning, whether it's into retirement, we had to retire this week, or um, just getting out of the business altogether, um, or going to another agency, um, inevitably every single one at least mentions this how mentally and physically fatigued they are. And oftentimes our officers that um, are young and, and maybe new in their career or in the mid, midpoint in their career and they're moving on to another agency, one of the driving factors is um, their balance of work and home life and just the, the pace of what we do, which is kind of the point I was trying to make with the influx of population and the amount of service calls. N nobody answers more service calls than police department and um, that does take a factor so um, even though that we have made you know, considerable positive strides to address compensation over the years um, like um, you would expect other municipalities our, 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 our partnering agencies in the Midlands and then throughout the state um, and then uh, with our state agencies everybody has adjusted as well so it's, it's, it's just a constant, you know, adjustment and readjustment. So um, some things that, that I hope we can frame up today is something that I think would sustain us being at a competitive um, recruiting and retention level for, for years to come. And I think, I think as we address um, our pay, the one thing that we haven't had a structure in place that, that allows for that as I have learned in my discussions in the last few weeks, that horizontal um, and vertical growth. Um, so we know we, it would make sense for us to have our pay separate, um, to have bands uh, that allow for growth and movement, that there, there's capacity in those bands to, um, to move. I think what we hear time and time again from our officers, they just want to know what they're going to make when they are hired, and what they'll make you know, five years, 10 years, 15, and so on. Um, and, and then we also know that we need to be the agency that um, is attracting certified police officers that we can onboard and immediately um, put boots on the ground. And this, this model that we're looking at um, you know, has a, a mechanism for moving certifies in and crediting um, tenure and, and having a pathway into transition into, um, you know, into our pay bands that I think will make us even more competitive. And then, of course, uh, we often talk about take home the uh, take home car program, um, which most, if not all, of our com you know competitive partners in the business um, have. Um, I believe that you know the manager and staff have come up with a you know funding mechanism for that that uh, I think we're going to talk about with you all. Um, we we know we have an opportunity in the future um, to really drill down on um, a solid strategic plan for our facilities. Um, a couple of things that, that I'm going to recommend that we bring forward is um, the ability to do a couple of studies. One would be staffing um, and, and how we um, deploy our staffing. We have five regions. Uh, we've consolidated one, but our regions have always been aligned based on council um, districts, um, which is it might be convenient for some purposes, but it really doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of where we need to put boots on the ground. And the other thing that comes with that is once we determine where our staffing needs are, 
and our deployment levels need to be, then we can determine on how we want to divide our city up for services and then make some um, informed strategic plans on where we would want a region headquarters um, centrally located in that service area. Um, it may be existing property or it may be um, something that we would build to suit, but, but most importantly, we need to have a strategic plan uh, that we can you know, pull off the shelf at any time and implement at any time. And um, I think having uh, facilities, um, vehicles, and competitive play that competitive pay that is um, indicative of a capital city is how we recruit and retain the very best for our police department. When did they start aligning the uh, the, the uh, metro districts and all with the council districts? I, I, I did not realize that's what you were doing. Uh, that, that predated me, which is no no excuse. Um, eight years, uh, I own everything now, um, and when it comes to the police department, so it's it's just. Uh, um, I think you know, once upon a time, it 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 made a lot of sense, and it might even have um, you know fell along deployment lines better. But um, you know, we have. I think we the city has changed dramatically um, in the time that I've been here, especially if you just look in our business district where we have. You know, what used to be maybe nine to five Monday through Friday, it is seven days, 24 hours a day now. Um, we've seen, you know, an explosion with um, downtown living, but we've also seen tremendous development um, in the Northeast and, you know, and in the West. So we've just got to, um, we've got to make some adjustments. And I, I think timing is right as we're looking at how we're budgeting for positions and, um, and assigning folks strategically. Uh, I think timing's perfect for that. Chief, do you have um, any, or city manager, do y'all have, Teresa, do y'all have any concept on the cost of a, the study on staffing? Uh, no, I don't have that yet. We're incorporating it into okay. the budget. That's what was going to be the next question. So we're looking at doing that as part of the budget yes, for next sir. year. The study of staffing, dividing, how you divide the city for service and, and then where to locate. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think that, I really think that's. on a, another slide at the end, but he was teeing it, it up now. He's, he's okay. ready to, he's yeah. ready to tackle just, all of it, right? He's pretty much done the whole and presentation. Mary, and, and Mr. Yeah. Du, Mr. Duvall, when you, you're going to make a verbal report to council tomorrow. I, I um, probably will, yes. Well, I would include these, the, the concept behind these studies in that report. I think that's something really important. Okay. Well, how about uh, realignment of the district? Well, the whole thing is a study on, on how to, where, how and what, how to staff up? Well, you got a slide, so maybe you'll be able to incorporate the slide. Yes, sir. It's just a slide on the different <laughs> recommendations, but yes, sir. We'll make sure you have some bullets. Okay. So Chief has done a great job of kind of summarizing. So I'm going to drill down a little bit more in all of this. A little quicker at work there. Okay, so I've given you all some handouts, and again, like Ms. Wilson said, this has been a collaborative effort between Skip, um, Chief Holbrook, um, Tanise Javis, our HR director, and Missy Kaufman, our budget program director, and Ms. Wilson. And so just to give you, frame this up a little bit, as Skip's, as Chief Holbrook stated, I keep going to Skip, as Chief Holbrook stated, um, the city has made many deliberate efforts to try and effectively manage the compensation for the police officers. And so we did want to give you a little bit of his history behind some of the things that we've done. So since 2014, uh, we've done across the board increases, uh, made some COLA adjustments, merit adjustments, and those are all kind of outlined on that following slide, which is um, your third slide in this little chart. And we're going to advance it when I get a little quicker. There we go. And so you can see since 2014, some of the things that have happened, and I don't want to confuse you with this chart, but we wanted to show kind of things we've done for the police department only, COLAs that all staff, including police staff, have received and merits that all the staff have received. And citywide. so citywide. All is and so, all, so this is just kind of a visual to demonstrate kind of some of the um, progressive increases that we've done. 
Um, you'll note in 2014, 2015, we did a, a comp and class study that was done for the whole entire city. It was done by Evergreen, who um, Stacy Witchell is on, the, on with us today to talk about this next phase. Um, but that comp and class study was implemented in 2015, um, fiscal year 2015, 2016, and fiscal years 2016 and 2017. What happened was we phased it in. We did a two-part um, implementation because it was very expensive. And so we did half one year and then half the prior year. So employees averaged between about an 8.8% .8 increase, um, or they went to the midpoint. Uh, they got 5% or were, were capped at the midpoint or 5%. So it depended on where you were where your salary was at the time of the comp and class study as to how much increase that you received. So I didn't want to, I don't want to get all deep into that, but that was something that we implemented and council was very supportive of that at the time. Since then, since in 2017, 2018, um, police officers got a 5% if, if you were ranked below a captain and a 3% if you were captain and above and they did get a COLA, 2% COLA at that time as well. Uh, we made some pay grade changes where we upgraded some of their pay grades in 2018, 2019. And um, that same year, staff, everybody in the city got either a 2.5% merit increase or a 3%, depending on whether you exceeded, um, met or exceeded the expectations for the performance um, system that we have in place. Um, police got... $2,500 bonuses in 2019, 2020, and we also gave merits that year. We, we either gave a 2% or a 2.5% that year. Um, in 2020, 2021, we got the not, they got, police got 9% for officers ranked captain and below, or 5% for a captain and above. Um, we did not issue any merits. Um, we also, um, that would have been when we did, no, that would have been 2022. We gave um, premium pay, if you all will remember that. Um, and we also gave uh, $500 vaccine incentives in 21, 22, 2022. Um, so those were received by, by everybody. And I didn't include that in the chart because everybody got that. And then we did give a 3% COLA earlier this year. So that just gives you some perspective on the efforts that we have made to try and you know, stay up to date. But as Chief, as Chief Holbert said, it's a, always a competitive game. The, the, um, our counterparts throughout the region, they're increasing their salaries. It seems like every time we increase our salaries, they increase <laughs> their salaries. Some of you may be aware that they've recently done a law enforcement study for this whole state and they've looked at salaries. So we're, our timing is in line with some of the reviews that are going on out there. So I wanted to give you this next slide just to show you the, the way that the pay grades are structured now, the positions, the entry level, salaries, the midpoints and the maximums. I also have a handout that kind of breaks this down even more. You will notice that there are some skipped grades and sometimes the sequencing doesn't go quite like we would like it. And so that is part of Evergreen also looking at our rank structure and the pay grade structure to make sure these things are all aligning and it all makes sense. And like um, Chief said, allowing for some horizontal movement in salaries as well as those vertical movements for promotions. And so just some couple things to point out, um, the entry level for cadet, you'll see police officer, that ranges based on that sheet that I've given you, you'll see there are five um, levels that police officers can come in, depending on their previous experience, whether they have a college degree, um, whether or not they have um, an associate's degree, or they speak a second language. So you'll just see a little range there. So this is what we currently have implemented. I just wanted you guys to kind of be able to see what the salary look like for each of those positions and um, you'll also see that there is some progression when someone is promoted and it's either 5, 10 or 15 percent depending on what level they're being promoted to um, and so that's just there for your reference and you can see the chart it shows you that specifically for those ranks. 
Does anybody have any questions about that? I just kind of want to give you a picture of kind of where we were and what that looked like. In addition to our salaries, um, we also, Chief and his um, staff have tried to be creative with some of the incentives that they provide in order to recruit some of our um, young police officers or, or new police officers, I should say. So this is a list of the incentives that we do offer. So we offer a referral bonus. If you are a police officer and you go out and recruit someone and they join the police department, you get a $500 referral bonus. Um, there's a residency bonus for staying in the city of Columbia. Um, we have a signing bonus program, and you'll see in that little chart with the, with the officer there, it shows the different levels of signing bonuses, and you'll also notice that you get a certain amount per year. So that's why I included that chart or that little um, visual. So you can see, for example, if you're a South Carolina certified police officer, you're eligible for the $5,000 sign-in bonus, but it's payable in different amounts, different years. So when you complete FTO, you get um, 1,666, the first year anniversary, 1,667, and then the second year anniversary, 1,667. So, yes, sir. And that's that's base pay, right? That doesn't count overtime. The bonuses, yeah, the incentives. So the whole pay, the whole yes, sir. Yeah. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's base. base. Thank you. So it's plus overtime. Right. That's base pay. But I mean, if somebody earns overtime, I mean, they get added. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Chief, does the certified out of state have to go through the academy? Some portion of it, yes. They, they, they literally look at that case by case to, um, based on where they come from, what the curriculum was, but at the minimum, I, I'm an example of this. Um, you would go through um, South Carolina law, uh, domestic, you know, mm -hmm. the laws are unique to the state of South Carolina. There's, so there's certain core classes that you have to take. Mm -hmm. it's, about, it's about four weeks worth of uh, classes, or you can also test out of that. Which um, I I chose to do that. Which um, if I had to do it again, I probably would. Pass? I passed. Thank goodness. There's a lot of pressure. I waited till the last. Uh, but um, but there they they look at that case by case and and uh, they tell you what curriculum that you're required to do. So wouldn't that have been fun if Chief failed? No, that would have been really fun. Yeah. I do have a question, Pam. Um, of the incentives, do we know which ones are being um, used? the most or that we're getting um, that are being the most effective or really really I mean are they really helping or do we have them out there and you know uh, that's probably debatable that's a great question um, I, I think we've had the best of intentions with with our incentives um, we have not seen the um, the result of for example the the signing bonuses for certifieds that we thought uh, that's not unique here. Um, our friends in Rock Hill um, had a billboard right outside of the academy that they ran for about a year offering a $10,000 signing bonus, and um, it, it, it was not as effective either. And, um, you know, I think there's a, a billboard on, um, I think it's I-20 I in Phoenix uh, PD with the signing bonuses. So I, I think the jury's out on signing bonuses. Um, I think we've been um, pretty innovative in creating some incentives, internal incentives for some specialized units that require um, pretty high level certifications and, um, and um, to create interest in serving in, in those different capacities. But the unintended consequence that comes with that is it's really um, thrown us out of whack um, internally with these pay bands. That's why we think there's um, a, a very important need to kind of retool that and hit reset and just clean all this up so it's simpler, better, effective um, all across the board. Thank you. So if, if no one has any questions about that so far, Chief has all also done a great job of teeing up um, what Stacy is going to talk about. So Stacy's, she's on the line. She's the consultant that we have 
um, are having the pleasure to work with on this project. And so Stacy has, um, and Stacy, I'll let you kind of give your whole resume, but Stacy has lots of user experience of doing compensation and classification studies. And so she has been assigned by Evergreen to be our consultant. So Stacy, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself before you start going into the slides? Yeah, I can do that. I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, you guys are a little bit muffled, so I'm, I'm assuming you can hear me okay, though. Yes. We can, Stacy. We hear you clear, crystal clear. Okay. Okay. So my name is Stacy Witchell. I am with Evergreen Solutions. I'm a project manager, and you were based out of Tallahassee, Florida. And Evergreen, as a company, I think we're a little over 800 class and comp type projects now that we've done from coast to coast, um, all but four states, actually. So we've done quite a bit of this work. I've got a lot of clients right now who I'm listening to the conversation that you've had leading up to this that are also struggling with public safety. Um, it's, it's a challenge right now for, for everybody. Um, it's Pam and I have been talking a lot. We had a meeting last week thinking about some, some options and strategies moving forward to address some of your more immediate needs and then also kind of put you in a better position moving forward. Um, I jumped over the rest of the stuff about myself. Uh, a little bit more about me. I'm a native Tallahassean. Um, actually spent 24 years with state government. I uh, left there as a director for one of our divisions, uh, for one of the agencies. I've worked at four different agencies throughout my career, and two of them were law enforcement agencies. So I've got a pretty good background and understanding of the types of things that, that you're talking about and the challenges that you're facing. Uh, my friends at uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement actually is facing some of the same challenges at that state level too. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different world right now. I guess I'll just say that. All right, Ms. Stacy, we have your slides keyed up. I don't know if you can, I don't know what you can see on your end, but we're, we're ready. I can see it. So what, you wanna jump in and go to the next slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So we'll advance them for you as we go along. So based on a lot of our conversations, I just kind of wanted to set the stage a little bit, kind of follow what, what you had already been talking about up to this point and some of the those challenges, that competition for quality staff. I heard mention of the billboard. Um, got another client in a Midwestern state that their neighboring county put a we're hiring advertisement on the billboard right across from their county administration office. Uh, I thought that was, that was kind of a low blow, but uh, we're seeing that in multiple areas. Um, get vacancy rates that you're you're challenged with right now. Um, recruiting folks in and hiring, but then losing them. About what was that about in the seven year, five to seven year, ten year range, and having folks move on at that point too. Um, looking at external equity peer organizations, making sure you're staying competitive. And then also, you know, do you have sufficient level of your classifications? So those are all the kind of setting the stage for what we're going to talk about here. And, and in thinking about your plan now, you currently have an open, open range plan, which does provide you with a lot of flexibility in how you want to do added duty pays, supplementals, and, and also when you're hiring people in, where do you place them? So you, have, you do have more flexibilities with an open range plan, but we want to take a look at a step plan and kind of show you what that could look like. Set plans are pretty common within the public sector um, environment and um, it give you an idea here. So we wanna make sure this is based on being competitive, slightly ahead of the market average. Um, we'll provide you consistency in your structure, give you some flexibility moving forward as far as enough room vertically and horizontally. And, and, and talking through and looking at your numbers, not just for public safety, but for the rest of your, your departments, we're going to recommend doing a step plan for just your sworn staff only. Okay. And the next slide that we're going to look at, these are examples. Um, please don't hold me to these numbers yet. <laughs> we are still working on collecting the rest of that data so we can true up all of your information based on a market study. But the information next will kind of give you an idea of what we could create for you, if that makes sense. All right, next slide. So speaking sworn only, we're talking about a step pay plan design. Um, 
oh, I changed you. This is not 15 pay grades. I took away some of those pay grades. Um, we're going back and looking at it again this morning. So let's amend that to 10 pay grades and then a range spread that's going to be in the neighborhood of 60 to 65 percent. And then a grade progression of about three to three and a half percent as you increase in those levels. Stacy, can you repeat that? Yeah. Being that that's going to change, and you think it will be ten, but again, we're—I mean, we're trying to get this to council in real time. So I hope they're bearing with us because they've been asking for it. So we we're giving it, but there's some slight adjustments here. It could be twelve, right? But now you're at ten. It could be. Uh, so we went back through and I looked at your current, all of your current classifications you have in in police. Okay, so I'm talking only police sworn right now. And if I look at what you currently have, I cut that down from 15 to um, to the 10. You'll see here in just a minute. All right. Now, yeah. as a final, we, we may need to make some adjustments um, when we look yeah. at all of the classifications in total, anything else that you may or may not want to add later on. OK, so right okay. now what I'm going to show you is just looking at moving forward. And then range spread, I did adjust because I because I cut the pay grades down to make sure you had enough horizontal room. And I did leave it at 15 steps for the pay grades. 15 steps for the pay grade. And what was the range spread? Change to 65%. Yeah, it's, it's on the next slide. Let's take a look. Okay, so here's what this could, could look like. 60 to 65. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it's 60 to 65. and. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to update that that slide before. That was based on what I was looking at, but then I've cut it down to reflect currently your your current police structure. Okay, so just kind of keying in on that part right now. So your range spread would be sixty to sixty five percent. I would increase that with that when you hit the captain level. We'll go ahead and broaden that range out a bit more. These are already broader than what you currently have. They're more you you're a little bit more narrow than this right now. Um, great. So you would have a 201 would be that entry level cadet position. And then you would come to 202 police officer. And there's a great progression there at 12% because that's where your folks are, are sworn. You hired them on. And I know that you have some different levels based on degrees and experience, other things that we could talk about placement of later on. 203, four down to 210. I added the words, you know, the titles in there along with that grade column. So you could equate them back and forth because it's hard when your numbers and your system changes on you. But this would bring you to a starting and a cadet of 40,000. And I think right now, Pam, correct me, 37 and change. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the road, so I only have one monitor. I might used to have my two monitor set up so I can have multiple things pulled up. So your cadet right now is around 37. So this will be starting you at 40. And then your police officer at that 202, we would increase that from just under, I think, 42 to closer to 45, 44, 8. And then you would have well, you can see the rest of the progression, 202, 3, 4, 5, 6, hitting each of those levels that you've had. And hopefully I didn't um, miss anybody. If I did, let me know. We'll definitely get them added in there for you. You'll see on your grade progression that 201 to 202 is a 12%. So that's the difference between as you increase in your grades vertically. Okay. So 12% there is the difference between your cadet and then when you first become sworn. And then we'd have a 5% grade progression between 202, three, get down to 206. But then with that increasing levels of complexity, roles, responsibility, leadership, increase that, increase that grade progression to 15 to, to 20%, which does adjust your step levels when I go to increase that grade progression some and the, and the range spread. But you're still averaging. St you're still averaging Stacey, three and a half would, would you uh, give me the definition of range spread? It is from minimum to maximum? It is. Range spread is the difference between min to max. And the grade progression is the percentage between from one grade to the next grade. 
as you go up. And then she she had the steps projected at three point four percent for each step, and she'll show you what that looks like in the next on the next slide, because that's one of the things. Stacy, this is one of the things that Chief Holbrook has talked about a lot when we talk when we show the steps that people kind of want a, a sense of where their salary will be as they move along. So from year one to two, three to four, and she'll she'll show you that in a second. I'm sorry, Stacy. Go ahead and say what you're going to say. Uh, no, you're fine. Um, so what what was I going to say here with this one? I was going to say that your current range spreads are a little bit more narrow. Um, and I know we talked about you know, people reaching to midpoint uh, pretty quickly through some of the changes that you've made. This will give you a wider range spread so folks have longer in those pay grades if they need them, if they don't move vertically and get promoted and move through the ranks. So it gives you more room before somebody is reaching midpoint and kind of stalling, if you will. Okay. We do next slide. And then here's your public safety plan. Again, sworn staff only. And here's what your steps could look like. So this would be that, that average about three and a half percent adjustment on an annual basis. Sorry for the broken there. It was just, I tried to make it big enough so you could see it. Chief, uh, what's the normal time that a, one of our officers would be cadet before they became police officer? How long are you stay in the cadet category? Well, so we probably need to define that a little differently. Um, that I'm assuming that would be police candidate versus yeah. a cadet because yeah. we actually have a position, a cadet position, which is a non-sworn. It's a developmental program. We have eight, 18 to 21. So this would actually be a police candidate, someone that's in training. Um, Would they be going to the academy? Or do they have yes. to be a sworn officer? These are this these are sworn officers? This this would be somebody that's being hired to be a police officer that's in training. Brand new. They haven't been certified yet. So you would just, let's just say, for example, if it's a candidate, it would never stay a candidate more than 24 months. Right. So we really should take year three, four, five, six, seven, so on off of that candidate mark. Because they would move from, they would move from candidate. If they didn't move from candidate to police officers within a certain period of time. You can move them out, right? Right, right. right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So we could take take out. Is there a formal title for cadet? Yes. So just to clarify, a cadet um, is a civilian position that we offer to someone between 18 years of age and 21, and uh, many of our senior police officers came through the cadet program it's a um, you know it's a full-time with benefits position um, they acc acclimate themselves you know to the law law enforcement community um, it's um it's just a it's a great program to grow a homegrown um, you know citizen of columbia into being a police officer they're, they're not sworn and they're not armed correct Let's not imply that you can stay a cadet for 15 years. That's right. We can certainly change that. And of course, they wouldn't be able to be a law enforcement officer until until they were 21. Right. But, but for what um, Evergreen has here, that, that would be police candidate. That's a sworn, somebody that's sworn that's in training. Stacy, can you talk about what the steps do? The, do the steps really equate to years, essentially? Also, so hypothetically, if Chief was trying to recruit someone who already had four years of experience, would we would they come in, and this is how they could find where they fall in the plan at step four? So different different organizations handle this a little bit differently. What I see most commonly is, except for specialized and much higher level, is is almost half time experience. So somebody with four years experience would come in at a step two for their appropriate level. 
Now, it may not be what you guys decide to do with your compensation philosophy, but we do see that quite often because then that addresses the concern of you've got somebody that have been with the organization for five, 10 years. They are now a lieutenant. And if you bring somebody in right at their same level, then that creates an internal compression issue. And, and so typically there's going to be some weight, definitely weighting of their experience, but it's not always a one-to-one -one matchup. Does that make sense? It does. But it, but there's some discretion there or it depends, like you said, it depends on what philosophy we take about it. So if the Absolutely. chief felt like it was a certified, I mean, it was a lieutenant from somewhere else who had the same amount of experience as one of our lieutenants and he could conceivably put him, he wouldn't have to treat it as half. Not necessarily, um, right. Especially, I mean, they've got some of the special certifications, clearance levels, um, you know, that would be special consideration. I always recommend that you write that as, as guidance and not policy, so you don't kind of put yourself in a corner. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, just, so my, just for my clarity, that whole discussion, each one through 15 does not equate to 15 years. It's, it's not, it, or it does. It could. If we okay. decide that we want to move one year for every year, so a, a, it, it's kind of two things we're talking about, bringing someone in where we would place them, and if someone was just tracking on the steps moving forward. But so like a person who started one. at step one, like a brand new person right. started at step one, they could expect to be at step two, year two, step okay. three, year three, step four, but then we have to build in some type of compensation philosophy for where do we slot people who come in with other experience, but we'd have to have some type of methodology to be consistent and to be fair and with some levels of flexibility. Mark, my understanding is you're creating a career path here, right? So if you bring somebody in, you can almost say, here's a realistic expectation of where you might be in 10 years. Exactly. Right. And they don't have to come in at one dollar amount for one. Right. We could have the philosophy where they would come in, you know, based, at, off, of based off of whatever experience right. and, and education, what have you. They would they may come in, you know, at a step two or a step four or wherever they are. And then wherever they come in though, they would track along yeah. that progression. Right. Factoring in if they're but if they're promoted, they can also track vertically. Right. right. Their right. steps are there to do that as well. Very nice so far, by the way. All right, Stacy. And this is kind of talking a little bit about, you know, how how we implement. So, Stacy, can you go over these um, these strategies? And, and again, these are examples. We can determine which ones, you know, our methodology for implementation and how we want to move forward. So, Stacy, can you talk about these a little bit? Yeah, I'll go through these. So these, whenever you're bringing folks, staff over from an existing pay plan to a new pay plan, you've got to have implementation, implementation strategy um, because you, it's not often a one-to-one -one crosswalk. And then on top of that, for right now, you guys are also going to be taking people from an open range system to a step plan system. So you got to figure out how do you place people on those steps. So the, the implementation options here, they're different calculations, different linear models. Bring to new minimum, what that would do is it would look at a, curtain, a person's current salary. It would crosswalk them to their new pay grade. And if they're already making above that minimum of the new pay grade, then the only adjustment that would be made would be making it, rounding them to the next highest step. Because it doesn't often fall, math to math doesn't often line up equally on steps. So if somebody is making 36, 88 an hour, we're going to round them to that next level step. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Class year parity and higher year parity, these are very similar. Class year parity is looking at the number of years that individual has in their current classification. And it looks at a 30 year career trajectory. So it's a linear model, 30 year career trajectory. It looks at what they're currently making. 
looks at their years in class, places them appropriately on this new model, and then would line them up. All right. So it's, I don't know if you can kind of, I talk with my hands all the time. I don't know if you can see that or not, but, but that's what it's going to do there. So it's going to look at their years in class, look across the 30 year career trajectory and line them up appropriately and then put them on the right step. Hired your parity does the same thing, but rather than the years in that current classification, it's looking at their years since they've been hired on originally. Um, this is often one of your most expensive options because it's looking, it doesn't take into account those vertical movements and promotions along the way. Okay, if they started in 1994, it's going to look at their career since 1994, rather than their career since they have been in that current classification for the last three years. Again, that's a linear model. It's going to run, a, run that regression, line them up, and then slot them. Current range penetration, that looks at their current pay grade and where they are. So if they're 30, 40% in of their current pay grade, it's going to crosswalk them to their new pay grades and place them that same percentage in. So basically, you're just moving people forward into this new system. And just now, as a point of um, history, that's what we did with our last one. We did the current current range penetrations, and because that was so expensive, we capped it at the midpoint, and then we only gave a certain percentage. Percentage. It was a lot of money. I understand. We'll, I was going to say we'll model. We'll model our existing before we do anything. Yes, sir. Perfect. That's yes, what sir. I'm make sure. So you can see financial impacts for the different models, and then we can make a determination as to which which way we go forward. And it, and it's key that we do that because we're right at budget. So we're trying to. I'm glad we're pushing through with this because we need to know and build that in. Question about the thirty year. Um, should we use 25 there instead of 30? It's actually 28. 28. 28? Okay. Why are people going out in 25? 28. Yeah. Do you want to go back up to the step plan? Is that what you said, Stacey? Yeah, if we, if we could. So we could increase these step plans, the number of steps at each level. And you're right, that 201, we can, it's, it's there for consistency. You don't need 15, 20 steps for, for that 201. But if you increase this to 28, we're going to have to really increase that range, range spread. And right now you're at 60%. Unless you're okay with, go back one more slide for me. So right now your step progression is about three and a half percent between each step. So in order, if you want to maintain that level annually, then we're going to need to increase that range spread. Otherwise, your step progression is going to come down to about 1 1.4, 1 1.6 maybe. Mm -hmm. And some organizations, um, Stacy will tell you that they stop the steps at a certain level and then people get bonuses or they don't get the steps anymore because as if you do if you have steps all the way out to year 28 then like she said then it it's going to shorten it's going to lower the percentage for each step because you're trying to stretch it out for so long that's right once you look at the modeling on that mm -hmm. it, it may end up being where you do see a combination of things in certain places you're bonuses and other places you're getting steps. Mm -hmm. And she sees it a lot, like merits, they get bonuses instead of, because now you're locked into a step. So you don't change those salaries based on the merit, but you may give them a bonus equivalent to the dollar amount and for that step. And the size of a three and a half percent raise on somebody making this is radically different mm -hmm. than the size of a three and a half percent raise. That's why, that's why I say the combination mm -hmm. can work out really well towards You know, and one, of, one of the things that we could do, um, uh, Pam, since you haven't talked about this yet, is we could increase, what, let, me, let me stop a second and think about, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here. So we could adjust the level of steps for some classifications, but then maybe not for some of the others. 
based on that based on the number of um, years you want to have. Once you get to your deputy chief and chief level, you typically are not going to have somebody in that classification for 28 years. Well, like I say, I think rather than okay. trying to figure that out here, we can model we run the them. models and, mm -hmm. and make the call. Yeah, definitely. Good. Does anybody have any other questions for Stacy on kind of conceptually what we're talking about? I mean, one of the things that I would ask, just in this is a very clear, a theoretical ask is, you know, as we're looking at reforecasting the way this pathway would work, um, can we look at leave allowances and things like that too? If there's ever, you know, the, the best time to true up things that may or may not be uh, having a negative effect is when you're, when you're doing raises. I mean, I'm just not so sure that overall, that our leave policies are congruent with the private sector. It, 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 you know, in other words, we're getting out of here where we're, our highest paid folks are, are accruing, what, five weeks of annual leave, three weeks of sick leave, and 11 holidays. Um, I'm just, just wondering if it's not worth, not saying do one thing or the other, but uh, this would be the time to look at that if we were going to look at it. And I would just add, too, from that perspective, I would be more interested in what other agencies are doing that we're competing with, because I don't think we're really competing with the private sector. Um, when people are leaving, they're going to other agencies. From a competitive standpoint, um, and we're trying to make our packages appear to be as competitive. So I think they can look at both. Private. Whatever you like, Ms. Harvard. I would just tell you that. <laughs> I'm just... That Right. Almost two months of leave is, I mean, it creates the need for additional, it can create the need for additional personnel that if things were, I mean, again, what you see more and more of today, and uh, I've heard that the mayor mention it before, is a PTO program, and I just don't know if you should, if you would switch it in one department citywide, but uh, um, it's, it's worth us taking a look at. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure, though, that we're mindful that, that we're competing, and I don't want us to do anything that would make us less competitive. Um, and when people are looking at, because actually my question was going to be to Chief, um, one of the things that he mentioned earlier was one of the main problems was balance of home and life, um, home balance work, um, and what we could do to address that. And so because that was resonating with me, I'm just concerned about it because I know that um, clearly that's a problem that Chief is worried about too. So if you take people's leave, I just don't know how that goes. I think we've um, got a very good, had a very good discussion here. And like Councilman Taylor said, when y'all run the models, we can, maybe can come back. Well, let's finish that recommendation because I think the recommendation pages is very important to go along with uh, review of the pay scale. Absolutely. So, Stacy, thank you so much for for those slides and for for your assistance with this presentation. So, as far as implementation uh, recommendations, you know, the first recommendation is to implement and fund the final whatever model we agree on um, compensation plan created by Evergreen. Um, the goal really is to separate it. Um, into its own pay plan with wider band ranges with steps and the more room for a pay progression. So that's, you know, that's really what we were talking about, the meat of this whole presentation. Um, the chief touched on some of the other things that he would like to see or he thinks that would be beneficial to us as a city to retain, recruit and retain is to fund the take-home car program um, past just the um, the cars that we've already given, the ones that he's projecting that he's going to need for the future to keep that program solvent and always um, being able to get those cars. Um, and Ms. Wilson mentioned that we've talked through some budgetary um, ways to do that. And then um, hire an officer wellness coordinator. There is a vacant position currently for that role. So it would be hiring somebody who could um, help with the physical well-being of our um, officers. Um, the 
um, and mental, yes. Um, the assessing the fire, de I mean, ugh. chief, you've been giving me the evil eye. That's why I said fire. Um, <laughs> assessing the Columbia Police Department's facility needs. Um, I know that that's a big thing for a chief. Um, some of our facilities um, could need a little love, could use a little love, and some facilities could be um, looked at. And so he certainly advocates for that. And then the, the last one was the regional uh, realignment and staffing that you, you refer to, um, uh, Mr. Taylor. So that's the last bullet that's there. So, Chief, I think I got all your recommendations you had so far and the ones you listed when we began this um, discussion. Did I miss any? No, ma'am. All right. Did you know the target would be to incorporate this in the upcoming budget? Yes. Yes, sir. Any further questions from council? I did have one question for Chief, going back to the, the balance of home and work. Is this a new issue because we have so few officers that folks are having to work a lot more? Or is this just, it is just an issue, period, just like, you know, it is in my practice? I, I think it's a combination, um, really. We, um, you know, we're, we're always doing more with less. Um, we have so many special events um, that we have to staff. And, um, and oftentimes that's, having somebody work overtime on a day off to, to be able to staff that. You know, what um, a lot of, one of the things we talk about with special events, especially when it comes to uh, parades and runs, for example, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter if there's um, 20,000 runners or 20 runners, you still control every intersection on that, on that route or um, a parade, you control intersections on that. So typically when we have events such as that, um, even though there may be different funding sources for that over time, that's it, that's not the issue. The issue is, the, is the, the time that the officer spends, you know, in that capacity on top of um, their normal duty. And remember, our officers work 12-hour shifts, and it, it's a rarity that you're that you work 12 hours. You're, you know, you're, you typically show up a little bit early, get your gear ready, your head ready, you have your roll call, you go to work, and inevitably. During the course of you know, your work, you're tied up finishing up your report, or you may be involved in an arrest at the end of the shift. So um, that, uh, and then oftentimes on your day off, you're being asked to you know work work other duties. Uh, city manager, since we're doing this and we want to get it into this year's budget, do we need to? to is this going to realign the fire department's pay schedule too? No, sir. This is effort um, but we are we're the, quite frankly the fire department the fire chief has already proposed their own plan internally that did not require evergreen but we are asking evergreen to take a look at it so we were just trying to handle police because the police department we think is really at the most critical juncture as far as a hiring situation I'm very proud of what Chief Jenkins and those have been able to do with their recruiting classes of late. I mean, he would say that he definitely wants to continue to staff up, and I hear him loud and clear on that, but he are, they are certainly not at the same place. Um, but we are going to take a look also at the fire department's recommendation. Thank you. Any other questions on the item one? Let's move to item three. Uh, Ms. Herbert, do you want to? Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. And we'll follow up after. All right. Safe travels. And this one will actually be, um, should be short and sweet. Um, as we listen to the challenges that our police department is having as they try and build back up, um, I just think it's imperative that we do whatever we can do to help the police department and look at prevention, um, decrease their caseload. And there was this nice little article in the state newspaper that I sent to Mayor Rickerman. Um, and so we had this on the agenda and then Mayor Rickerman sent his um, email, I don't know if you all saw it on Friday, um, discussing a Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Um, that was one of the recommendations. Essentially, when I was here at the city too, there's nothing new under the sun. 
So we look at and see what other cities are doing and see if it'll work for us. Um, I, in particular, thought that that was a great idea. Um, and I think that great minds think alike because Mayor Rickman wants to do an office similar to that. So my whole point was to try and come in here and convince y'all. But <laughs> I no longer had to do that because Mayor Rickman wants to do an office. So um, I have asked, and I think I have permission to, to assist in those efforts. Um, and it will be able to give you some details at our next meeting about um, partners. and. But I think the, the real goal is to take the weight off of the police department because we need the police to be the police um, and look at all these community partners that we have. Everyone said, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? We need to have somebody who can coordinate and say, we need volunteers here, we need donations here, we need facilities here. So actually my, my, um, my goal has been achieved already. Thanks to me, Rick. We don't want to talk about any of those today. You're going. To... We we have talked. I wanted to talk about them just so we could push okay. one of them. But Mayor Rickman has already decided okay. to go for it with one. Preempted. Yes, and I'm excited about it. Well, uh, can I add one one thing? Sure. I, I, I read that article, and 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 there are, you know, a number of successful initiatives across our country. You know. We, we really like to follow um, evidence-based programs uh, that follow best practices. And um, we have a number underway here. Just, just so you know, um, I, I've seen the model that, uh, that you mentioned that the mayor is interested in, uh, especially dealing with the opioid crisis, um, you know, it, approaching things from a public health standpoint. Um, and, of course, there's a lot of um, harm reduction with our, our – the, the, efforts that need to be done with a lot of our children that are exposed to gun violence um, and just, you know, ad adverse effects that it has just when they see a law enforcement action with a loved one. But, um, you know, one of our marquee programs that we do is our ceasefire program, and we have a call in tonight. Uh, for example, we have about 30 violent offenders that will um, be attending this call in, and they hear a, a message from law enforcement, from all of our law enforcement leaders in the Midlands and the state, and then they'll spend the, the bulk of their evening with service providers that are there to um, provide um, some contacts and wraparound services for parenting, education, um, um, substance abuse, um, stability at home. Um, so who are the folks that call in? Uh, they are prolific offenders that have served time in, in the uh, State Department of Corrections uh, for violent crimes, and they fall into a very um, vulnerable population that's very statist statistically high um, that they will either reoffend mm -hmm. uh, or they'll be the victim of a violent crime. And um, they'll see some footage of many people that they're very familiar with that are involved in shootings. They'll, um, they'll see pictures of people that have not listened to this advice in the past and are sitting in prison now. And um, we have a recidivism rate um, that's, you know, um, in the single digits. And I mean, we, this is, I think this is our eighth call in. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic program. And, um, and we're part of, uh, as part of our Project Safe Neighborhoods, we're a target enforcement area. Um, you know, we're, we're one of just a couple in the state that has that designation, and we have that's what's led to us having that special assistant U.S. attorney. Um, and, you know, you, what I think is really not fully understood with um, a lot of our citizens is the significance of us being a, a, a gun crime intelligence center and, um, and the funding that came with that and the, the methodology with um, investigating and analyzing gun crime in, in order to implement best practices. So we've got a, you know, we've got some really smart people doing some tremendous work um, in, in this help, arena. Yeah, how can we help get that word out? Give me some talking points. I like going out and talking to folks. Well, we can do that. Chief, uh, the mayor made a commitment to more justice to review one of the programs. I know he's not here, but uh, that 
progressing. <laughs> Mic on, it is on. Uh, we, we made a commitment to, to pick a, a, a group to help analyze, and we have that in the works, um, uh, along with a greater discussion that will happen here in a couple of weeks, which I think will really bring a lot of uh, excitement to the public, a program that the chief and some other folks have been working on that uh, it would be a great announcement for this, for this city. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Any other business before come before the committee? If not, we'll stand adjourned to the next call.